Hello, this is Ed Pruitt, Editorial Director of NEJM Catalyst, and I'm speaking with Eveline Bischoff, MD, MPH, who is Associate Professor at Shanghai University of Medicine and Health Sciences, and is at Chao Tung University School of Medicine, and is also a Research Physician at University Hospital of Basel in Switzerland. Now, Eveline is in Shanghai right now and uh, has a lot of interesting observations about uh, living in China amidst the COVID-19 outbreak, as well as uh, advice for uh, other countries. So, Evelyn, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you very much for inviting me, and I'm very happy to connect. Would you please uh, begin by describing your experiences with COVID-19 in Shanghai, as well as your observations about the outbreak within the quarantine zone of Hubei? A medical doctor in China, I have to say that I have been definitely very fortunate to be here in Shanghai during the outbreak, since first of all, the number of cases in Shanghai was comparably very low. We only had about 400 cases overall and very little fatalities, luckily, which was of course different in Hubei, where the numbers reached over 60,000 and many more deaths. The curve is now flattening and I have observed a lot of measures that the Chinese government and Chinese healthcare system applied and implied, and they turned out to be very effective and efficient. And especially now, looking back at what's happening in Europe and the USA, I have to say that many lessons can be learned from China, and I hope that they can still be translated into the reality in many countries. So first of all, the experience here in Shanghai was very sobering. When I arrived back and I arrived shortly before the peak of the cases of the outbreak, shortly before the so-called clinical diagnostic criteria have been released and the peak of the numbers has been announced by the government, I have seen that landing here, everybody is under quarantine and there has been a very strict social distancing applied. So the observation in daily life were very interesting. First of all, there has been a triage not only of patients, but also of normal people like uh, society. For example, every compound, every building had guards at the entrance that were measuring temperature when entering and exiting the building. No non-resident was allowed to enter the building or any foreign person. And similar strategies, very strict triaging was applied also for the hospitals. And I think what is very important to know is that physicians that were not at the front line, physicians that were not designated to treat COVID patients, barely had any contact with patients that were suspected even with um, the infection. As to say, there were designated clinics in the town and they were very well announced. Every potential patient, every citizen knew which clinics are uh, those designated ones. And all the other clinics were working pretty much in the routine way. However, even if a patient arrived at the clinic, there were several gatekeepers, literally. So even at the gate, there was again, a check of temperature and some basic symptoms. Further, the patient went to a further triage with a nurse that was doing a more intensive epidemiological and symptomatical anamnesis. And only when everything was negative, the patient arrived to the doctor. So I guess it gave us doctors a lot of comfort morally to know that there is not that much anxiety to get infected from the patient. And secondly, also um, because the patients were even if they were suspected, they were immediately transferred to designated clinics. And similar things were done in Hubei, where the super hospitals were built in 10 days, which was phenomenal. So the infrastructure was there. And of course, all the doctors were protected with PPE and masks and special guards and garments. What was the, the clinical response um, 
and the, the social response and the interplay of these factors? So this is a very important question. Thank you for asking it because I believe that the clinical response and the social response were very much interrelated and there was a balance between those and even a slight disturbance would probably lead to very fatal outcomes. So on the one hand, clinically, there was a massive response from the physicians. There were teams mobilized to Hubei province from all the 31 provinces of China. And not only physicians were going to Hubei to help out, but they also went together with the equipment. So echo machines were mobilized, CRTs, specialists, epidemiologists, everybody was mobilized. Then there were the radiologists that were working day and night because um, radiological findings, the CT scan was and is one of those criteria which actually can define a patient um, even before a serological test is being done. And this was very helpful at the beginning because we have to remember that all the things that we know now, we didn't know them back in January and February. Clinically, doctors were very well informed and the communication from the government down to the, pay, to, the, to the physicians and also to potential patients and to society was very effective. There were clinical guidelines that were developed and updated constantly. I recall that we have received through social media and through our channels, the specific medical channels on WeChat, updates almost every day. How to treat patients, what are the updates on the clinical guidelines, what are the treatment guidelines, um, very, very strict triage guidelines and so on. Of course, we were advised that in case if we have any symptoms, fever, whatsoever, we are supposed to stay home. Not even that, we are not allowed to go to the hospital. And um, so this was definitely one of the very important clinical response. And nobody was forced to go to Wuhan to help out or to help in the designated clinics because as I mentioned, um, there were specific clinics to treat COVID patients. Um, and they were, so the patients with COVID were never melanged with normal patients, comorbid patients and so on. Mm -hmm. um, on the social side, I, what I have observed and what it, which was extremely interesting is that the society responded very well the communication, again, was at the level of the health literacy, which cannot be assumed at a very high level. There is a big part of, of the society um, of older people, and even those were very stringent with the social distancing, with wearing masks. So we were not allowed to leave our homes without a mask, not even to mention going into a shop or any public space without a mask every entrance to every public space and even the residential houses uh, was always uh, with a protection, with temperature checking, with registration and so on. And even until now, and I think this is something that, that is important, even until now, all of all, everybody has a QR code, electronic QR code that we have to update every week and this QR code is allowing us to go to specific places and there is a whole algorithm behind it. And although there was a shortage of masks, for example, just to give an example of a social response, I forgot my mask once in the elevator. And I was there with an older lady, an older Chinese lady. She said to me, you have to wear a mask for your own protection. And I said, I just forgot. I just said, I don't have. She probably understood that I do not possess one. She immediately took one out of her pocket, although it was such a valuable <laughs> piece of, um, of of important prevention, and she gave it to me. So socially, uh, people were supporting each other very much. That's fascinating um, and very stringent. Very when we were speaking before, you described, uh, you mentioned that you had uh, conducted a survey of Chinese physicians uh, could you please tell us about that? What were the goals of the survey and the respondents and, uh, and your findings? Sure, with, with pleasure. We were curious about how those physicians who are not at the front line, but those who are supporting 
the entire rest of the population medically cope with the situation, with the quarantine, with treating the patients under the constant fear of potentially being infected. And we had about 450 responses. And I, I would just highlight the, the most interesting findings, which, which I found very impressive. So while the outpatient number was reduced for uh, of, of about 50%, the inpatient um, numbers was pretty stable. And while about 50% of all the responders stated that they were afraid that they could be infected by their patients, they still continued working. And there were, and this might be also a very interesting point applicable for, for Europe and the US, there were available psychological support sites for physicians, specifically for medical workers, uh, among those also physicians. And about 20% of the responders stated that they actually needed psychological support during that time. And I was very happy to see that 80, 18% answered that they actually used them. So those were really in demand. They used the resources and the resources were in place. Um, something we learned from the SARS and MERS epidemics and that was translated into reality right now very quickly. There were very many options to get support. What we were also very interested in was to see if those physicians um, who who uh, were here in China, if they consider leaving medical profession and or if they consider switching into being a medical professional, but not in clinical settings, but switching, for example, to industry. And we have consistently about 11 to 15 percent of physicians stating that they had those thoughts, they were hesitant, but at the end of the day, they did not uh, make any steps towards it. And last but not least, what we perhaps we will be talking about also later is we have asked the physicians how much did they use digital medicine, telemedicine during that time. So many of the follow-ups and consultations were immediately transferred into digital um, telebases which were available, which are used usually, but were much more exploded right now during the crisis. And so most of the doctors, 45%, said that they see telemedicine as a very good alternative also in the future. So I guess this is also kind of a positive development. So one takeaway uh, from this survey is that uh, the care of physicians and medical professionals during this outbreak has has been high, has been strong. Uh, there have been measures implemented to assure their health and protection. Uh, do you think it's been sufficient? I think it, it, it has been sufficient. Um, all the physicians were very well prepared. They have been briefed about the disease they have been constantly updated with novel updates, whatever there was in terms of research, in terms of guidelines, in terms of measures from the government. And they have been also prepared and given the free choice if they would like to really intensively help at the front line or not. And many of them did. So we see a huge solidarity and unification also during that time. So then what is your advice for hospitals and healthcare professionals in other countries? In other countries, I am looking at Europe and the US and I'm receiving a lot of questions from my peers, from colleagues and even from doctors which I do not know, asking about clinical advice. And of course my advice would be a maximum self-protection, but I know this is very difficult. Another advice would be, for example, to look more into the radiological testing while in several countries there is not enough, not sufficient amount of tests that can be performed in the cleaning. But overall, I think 
my main message because all the other messages are out there and I know that it is very difficult from from many for many reasons to, to achieve that what China has done I think what we should do is to look into the future because at this very moment we do not know what will be the long-term effects and side effects of this virus we do not know what type of further organ tissue damage this virus might cause we we assume that there will be a permanent lung damage and it's very possible but we cannot really predict yet what be the next and this is why I would definitely appeal that we should record as much data as possible even if it's just clinical cases and outliners because if we can create a big data set kind of a metaomics integration then we can actually translate those data into health trajectory and can react faster in the future and some of the questions are very 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 important right now for example I have been asked if there is any good biomarker for the prognosis and prevention and for tracking the disease at this moment we really do not have it we are using the very basic markers that we have markers of inflammation which which are not really very useful at the very moment we do not have a biomarker of severity so we do not really even have a strategy for a personalized treatment so at this very moment I would say this would be the highest priority collecting as much data as possible and from the personal point of view I know it's very difficult but I suggest to stay as calm as possible the panic and the mass hysteria that is being observed all around the world was not at least very present here in China and I think this has helped us all here healthcare professionals to proceed systematically and consistently and to really succeed in in terms of focusing on the patient care we were also not as much overwhelmed with a lot of information that is the case right now on the one hand it's very good that there are so many clinical trials and so so much information coming from different sources I guess on the other hand it's very difficult to filter them and we didn't have it at that time and some of the information are very worrying so I guess keeping focused on the medical care and also thinking about the future would be would be my core advice very interesting thank you um, the importance of data collection for the future is so it's not being widely discussed right now so based on what you are seeing and hearing around the world, uh, are you optimistic or pessimistic about the course of COVID-19 over the next few months? I would say I am a little bit um, partiated. I'm relatively pessimistic about how the cases of fatalities will develop and I guess any loss of life is tragic. So I would be hesitant in saying that everything will be fine, but there will be an end to it and from the Chinese perspective I can say in Shanghai for example um, life is getting back to normal although there are still very stringent policies in place in order to protect us all here and and also in terms of uh, global perspective from the second wave so there are still very strict rules for example about the quarantine of people who are returning to China. They are extremely strict, uh, beginning already in the airport, and they have been evolving. So all the three months, this has been a constant, very dangerous process. We have been learning about the tests. We have been applying the tests first um, in a centralized lab, then moving them into the clinics. The same was done for the triage. And now, for example, the returnees are um, being not quarantined in their homes as it has been done for the last three weeks but only on designated places in the hospitals um, I think that's very important and I think it is also important to look at the positive points in order to be a little optimistic I think this epidemic has taught us a lot and put more emphasis on the healthcare in general 
and at the end of the day we realize how important medical profession is so I hope that doctors will regain their confidence in in the choice of their profession and I think we see a lot of um, collaboration and coming together of biomedical research and this is very important as a resource for the future I think we have seen that many research funds also have been released very quickly and there has been a lot of facilitating um, processes in terms of um, trials, initiations and so on. We have seen that China has leveled to the West or in terms of preparedness perhaps even um, overrun the West in some terms. And I think um, what we see and what has um, received a big push through this crisis is personalized medicine and the use of big data and artificial medicine in order to in order to target hypotheses and for example um, rapidly discover drugs or even creating molecules towards new treatments so this will allow us also in the future to very quickly repurpose the possibilities and I think in this time change at the forefront uh, Evelyn, thank you so much. This has been fascinating, really informative. Uh, the uh, readers and listeners of any jam catalysts around the world will benefit. Evelyn Bischoff from Shanghai, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. It was a pleasure.